You may have noticed I had a little bit of trouble titling this lecture, and that's because it's a combination of a lot of things rammed together, as usual, but I pretend every week that that's somehow unique. I have faith that you'll survive it and maybe even enjoy it. The videos on the screen usually run before class, and I want to describe what's happening because it really helps understand what we're going to look at in class today. On the left is a tubing bender like the one we have in our metal shop. It's totally manual. The tubing is supported on both sides so that as it bends, it doesn't collapse. It's stretched on the outside, compressed on the inside, but because there's support all the way around, the tubing maintains its integrity. But you can understand how that would limit your ability to form something in tubing. The bends happen on one axis at a time. So you make a bend, whatever angle you want, and if you want to change the angle of bend, you have to unclamp your work, reclamp it in another position, and make a second bend. So it's fussy, it's hard to be accurate, you can't control the exactness of the bend, and you also can't really control where you start and stop that bend. That's the kind of bending we're going to be looking at in this lecture. The bender on the right is a more recent innovation, and that's how things are made today. It's using a collar controlled by a computer that can move on every axis. Real time, as the tubing is pushed out, it's moving around and changing the angle of bend. As a result, the tubing can be bent in any direction possible, and there can be smooth transitions from bends on one axis to another. That's not what anyone had available until really recently, and that really changed the way we use tubing. The designs we're going to look at today required a sort of collision of technologies to work, so I want to go through those and just help you understand the materials and the manufacturing processes that were required to allow the innovation we're going to focus on. The first technology relates to bicycles. In 1896, American bicycle sales exceeded 1.2 million. There were a lot of bicycles being sold in America. And they came sort of out of nowhere and were suddenly everywhere. They were so prevalent that they changed the experience for many people. There's a wonderful quotation, there's a wonderful observation that Susan B. Anthony recorded in 1896. She wrote, I'll tell you what I think of bicycling. I think it has done more to emancipate women than any one thing in the world. I rejoice every time I see a woman ride by on a bike. It gives her a feeling of self-reliance and independence the moment she takes her seat, and away she goes, the picture of untrammeled womanhood. Bicycles also brought many manufacturing innovations into play and brought the American system of manufacturing and what we called armory practice, which we looked at a few weeks ago, into transportation, paving the way for all of the automobile manufacturing that we looked at last week. Jim Hurd is a bicycle historian and a former curator of the Bicycle Museum of America, and he wrote that by 1900, there were two main buildings housing all of the US patents in Washington. One had the entire history of patents going all the way back to the 18th century, and the other had just the bicycle patents, which had only been filed in the past maybe 10 years. And that helps you understand the volume of innovation wrapped up in bicycle making. The second technology we need to look at is manufacturing of metal tubing. Bicycle making relies on tubing, and making tubing was not an easy thing to figure out. There are stories that London in 1815 had a sort of experimental coal burning lamp system installed and the gas pipe for that was made by welding together or joining barrels from discarded muskets. Those muskets were made by casting metal and then boring it. So they made tubing, but they weren't really made as tubing. They were turned into tubing later and that was a very expensive undertaking. There's also lots of room for failure if you're joining lots of small pieces. Another method of making tubing is to take a piece of sheet metal and bend it around, sort of make it into a C shape and then close that around until there's a neat seam and weld or solder that seam shut and then draw the tubing down into smaller, more even sections. When people figured out how to take sheet and put it through a series of forming rollers to make the tubing automatically, that sped things up. But that tubing still has a seam, and if you try to bend the tubing, you have to be aware of that seam because it's both a stronger spot from the weld and a weaker spot around the weld, and it's hard to bend that kind of tubing without it breaking or distorting. So the goal in tubing making was to figure out how to make tubing without a seam. In 1885, Reinhardt and Max Manusmann invented a method of making tubing that had no seam. And then in 1890, they introduced a pilger in the rolling process 
So the way this works is a thick slug of metal with a hole in the middle, like a steel donut, let's say, is moved back and forwards over this pilger. It's rolled on the outside and it's supported on the inside as it gets stretched ever longer and thinner and more regular. That combination of cross-rolling and the internal pilger became known as the Manasman process. And it's still how a lot of tubing is made today and the company still exists today. It's a $100 billion company today. The third innovation in this equation is an advance in metal plating. The plating industry had been around for a long time, but there was a big jump forward when we could add electricity to metal plating. Earlier methods of plating relied on batteries and were very small scale things. Once generators were added, we could build bigger tubs, wood with tar lining, and start really electroplating manufactured objects. But then once automobiles entered the equation, everything needed to be scaled up even more to be able to chrome plate large car parts to help them resist corrosion out in the world on the road. Also during World War I, the growing aviation industry required advancing some plating technologies and introducing hard chromium plating and bronze alloy plating. The Art Deco period was awash in chrome plated objects. Chrome and nickel plating were everywhere. And I suspect you noticed that in the Art Deco lecture. And that aspect of the Art Deco period exists in today's lecture as well, even though we're not really talking about the Art Deco style. We're going to look at lots of things that are plated using that new technology. What we're going to look at today is what happened when designers got their hands on these new materials and technologies. So we're going to start with the Bauhaus, where the investigation arrived at exciting and new and pure designs and created a new modern form language, but also produced designs that were too expensive for most people and also too alien to most people's taste or interests to really do well commercially. And then in the second half, we're going to look at what America did by taking the inspiration from Bauhaus and kind of cheapening it, making things that had less pure modernism, looked a little less European, were less expensive, and a little closer to what people might be able to use in their homes. I always have disclaimers. My disclaimers are, we're going to look at a lot of chairs. And I don't want to give you the impression that chairs matter more than other things, especially with what the world is throwing at you right now. I might argue that chairs are really not important. We have enough chairs that we never need to make another one ever. But three weeks in this semester, we will look at too many chairs. And that's not because the chairs matter. It's because chair making is a convenient way to try out new ideas, to test the limits of a new material, to try a new aesthetic or a new structural combination or technique. And so a lot of designers start with chairs as a way to understand the material, and then their innovations move into other fields. We'll see that with the Eames chair and plywood. Also, architects tend to design a lot of furniture because they make spaces that are unique to their aesthetic or their time, and there isn't furniture to match, so they produce it on their own. Try to think of the chairs as placeholders for ideas instead of objects. Also, you can add a chair to a room without needing to redecorate. You can adjust your aesthetic with one addition and not need to consider the rest. So I think chairs are easier to incorporate into our world. The other disclaimer is that today is kind of just a parade of people. I've strung together a lot of people that I think you should know about in a way that I think gives some narrative thread to their work. Some people don't fit in, they're just sidebars. Just deal with it. So my internal title for today is, you like hearing about the Bauhaus, but I'd rather talk about manufacturing. Here's part one, you like hearing about the Bauhaus. A few weeks ago, we were looking at the Art Nouveau period when we were all still together, and you did a great job giving me some adjectives to describe this style. Stretched bubblegum was my favorite. And we took some time to appreciate the really dramatic shift from this aesthetic into the Art Deco, which was all about geometry and shiny surfaces and zigzags and electrification. But look at the change now. We're going to go from this aesthetic to this one. It's the same time period but it's a completely different thing. So you could argue that this is still shiny surfaces and geometry, but there are fewer references to any other design effort. There's no references to older cultures, there's no zigzags, there's no surface decoration. This is a machine aesthetic. These objects look like they were made by machines. They're all about geometry and material integrity, and there's no apologizing. Nothing is being disguised as something else. I sort of struggle to talk about the Bauhaus in class because I care more about 
designs that change our everyday life, and none of these accomplished that. But where the Bauhaus really did change a lot of things in my world at any rate, and certainly my students' world, is in education. The basic syllabus of the Bauhaus, established by Walter Gropius in 1922, became the foundation for how all art and design schools have taught since, and until very recently, this is still how the RISD curriculum was organized with a foundation year based on the Bauhaus. I'm sure most of you have heard about the Bauhaus in other classes and are not really excited to have me do it all over again, so I'm gonna motor through this part. Henry van de Velde, whom you, I hope, remember from the Art Nouveau period, found himself in Germany as the director of something called the Grand Ducal Saxon School of Arts and Crafts in Weimar. And in 1915, he was asked to step down as director because he was Belgian, and Belgium and Germany were on opposite sides of the war. And he recommended that Walter Gropius succeed him. Walter Gropius transformed that craft school into the Bauhaus. As a result, in 1919, when the Bauhaus started, it was fundamentally a craft-based school. And the strong foundation that was added to explore education through color and form and contrast and basic geometry led to what we think of as the Bauhaus aesthetic, unadorned surfaces, circles, squares, cones. And then in 1923, Laszlo Maholinage, with some help from Joseph Albers, took over directing the Bauhaus and shifted to a more industrial approach. This was right after World War I, when everything was devastated and there was a real demand for consumer products and there was a need to get industry doing things better. So it was understood that art and design schools might have a hand in that and the shift towards industrial production is something that Gropius accepted out of necessity at that point. And then in 1925, the Bauhaus moved to Dessau with the understanding that it would try and finance itself with the manufacturing and sale of goods that it produced. In 1925, a corporation was set up with outside financing to manufacture the school's designs. And the idea was that the proceeds from that would help support the school, but the sales were not great because the designs that they produced were just too severe for the time. Also, these objects may look machine made, but they are not actually industrially produced. They're still mostly made by hand as craft efforts. And as a result, they were very expensive. So I want to show you a sort of parade of related designers, people who were at the Bauhaus and people who were adjacent to it. If this were an architecture history class, we'd talk about Walter Gropius more. We're not going to because there aren't a lot of objects we can use to talk about him, but certainly the things we have show an interest in geometry and a lack of surface decoration. But I do want you to be aware that when he moved to America, he built a house in Lincoln, Massachusetts. If we were all still here, I would try and figure out a way that some people could carpool up there and have a tour. It's a remarkable, remarkable experience. And when fleeing the Nazis to come to America, Gropius was allowed to bring his furniture. So at the time, it may have just seemed like some prototype furniture, but it has aged into being a remarkable collection of really important furniture that is very exciting to see in person. I want to give more attention to Marcel Breuer. The chair on the left is a chair he made as a student at the Bauhaus, and although it might not be all that comfortable, it's a beautiful exploration of what wood can do in a more modern way. And you can see that he was influenced by the Dutch movement, De Steele, and Gerrit Rietveld's work. It's a chair that's more about the artistic statement it's making than about being comfortable. But very quickly, Breuer managed to combine manufacturing savvy, comfort, and aesthetic beauty all into one. His work is evidence of really remarkable material investigations throughout his entire career. So at the beginning, he worked in wood. In fact, Gropius invited him to return to the Bauhaus when he graduated to become director of the wood shop in 1925. And when he started his new job, he also bought his first bicycle. It was an Adler bicycle he bought in 1925, and he discovered the remarkable properties of tubing, that it's structurally strong but flexible, that it can be used as straight tubes or also bent into different shapes, that it can be painted, it can be plated. The handles of these Adler bicycles were nickel-plated. And he tried to get Adler to consider making furniture based on some of his design ideas. They weren't interested. So then he went directly to Manusman, the tubing maker, and bought lengths of tubing to start experimenting. His early efforts are a little bit clumsy, and I love them because you can see the exploration. So in everything I show you for the rest of this talk, set your brain the job of understanding the construction. Where does the tubing start? 
what angles does it bend, what axes does it go around, where are the joints, and how do those joints happen. It's not an easy thing to conquer, and Breuer figured it out really well, really quickly, but everyone who took on the challenge had the same struggles later. So the goal, of course, is a single path. It's not made of one piece of tubing bent around. Because, remember, this was bent by hand, single axis bends, there's a joint after every bend and a straight piece, or there's a joint in the middle of a straight run connecting two straight pieces. So there are lots and lots of seams in this furniture, and a finished piece of furniture would be too big to chrome plate affordably. So the goal is to be able to make the parts and have them chromed and then assemble the chair. As a result, the decisions about where the joints go are really important. This is why I love seeing the furniture prototypes at the Gropius house. These are pictures that I took when I was there of some of the details. The production furniture doesn't look like this. These are explorations for a running joint with just set screws holding it in place, with connection joints where there's a bolt going through both pieces of tubing. They all work, but they're not as elegant as later solutions. Breuer's interest in tubing led to what is still his most famous chair, and it's the first one he designed. It was designed in 1925, but not produced until 1927. When he couldn't find someone to make it for him, he founded his own company, Standard Mobile. I also want to point out that Breuer called it the B3 chair. Vasily Kandinsky was enthusiastic about the chair, but it wasn't named the Vasily chair until 1962, when Dino Gavina began producing the chair under license from Marcel Breuer and decided it should be renamed. When he started this in 1925, this was the very first tubular steel chair. It was all bolted together. It was a pretty clumsy construction, but you can see with the parts spread out, it was radically few parts. This is kind of like the exploded view or disassembled view of the tonnet chair I showed you. It's almost nothing, and yet it creates a remarkable chair. There's a big challenge with tubing. You can go around a bend, and you can have running joints, but if you're going to do any other kind of joint, you have cutting and fitting and welding to do, and that makes it more expensive. So if the goal is to be able to bend the parts and plate them and then just assemble them with plugs on the inside and some set screws, you have to figure out something to do when you get to a corner or a junction. And this is where Marcel Breuer's brilliance really shows. He designed a seemingly endless run of furniture that played with that problem. So the table on the left, the tubing seems to go around where the leg would be, avoiding the whole problem of having a joint and the tables on the right use the piece of wood as the spacer, and the metal just continues past. Breuer also explored what he could do in places where you needed to have a junction to avoid having to cut and fit the tubing. On the left, you can see an assembly picture from a tonic catalog for that same nesting table, and you can see it's, there's a lot of handwork involved in assembling these things. And the picture on the right shows another Breuer exploration for what to do when you need to have a joint at the bottom where multiple tubes meet together. He found a nice cheat, which is to use two right angles bolted together. So from a distance, it looks like a, a cross shape, but up close, there's something else going on. And it's a fun puzzle to look at his furniture and try and figure out how one line of tubing could create a chair. Also, how can you support a person with the least amount of material? If the metal frame gives the structure, what do you put on that to provide the actual support? Fabric woven surfaces, a wooden frame. How can you maximize the relationship between the strength of the steel tubing and also the springiness that it allows? How can you make something sturdy enough to sit on, but still forgiving enough to be worth sitting on? With Marcel Breuer, form always followed manufacturing and material limitations. And I think his extruded aluminum furniture for Embruwerk shows this better than anything else. Aluminum extrusions had been around since around 1910, but it took the new airline industry to really force aluminum manufacturing into overdrive in the 1920s, and Breuer was adept at realizing that was an opportunity for him to make some pretty challenging furniture. This is the lounge chair on the left, and on the right, the patent for this chair. And the patent is fascinating because it's not a design patent that shows what the chair looks like. It's a utility patent that suggests every possible way an extrusion can be manipulated to provide the support for a chair and I've enlarged the part at the bottom because it helps you see the profile of the extrusions that he's proposing, and then above, how that extrusion can be split, and the two halves can wrap around in different ways to make structure. I think this is a very difficult chair to explain with words, so I hope that the combination of my explanation and these images helps you see what's going on here. There's a wide extrusion with two 
channels on the bottom. And then that extrusion is split down the middle. So in these pictures, you can see the tail end of the bottom of this chair where the extrusion is intact. And then pretty quickly it's split. And one side goes forward and becomes the lower front of the chair. And the other bends quickly up and becomes the armrest and then twists around to attach to the back, which is actually the other extrusion returning. So I'll go back to this first slide and you can see that in action. Each side of these chairs is one extrusion that's been split and bent. So they're mirror images of the same part. And then there's just spacers, wood or aluminum in between with one brace at the bottom. So it's sort of the least amount of fuss you can have and still make a chair. I think it's an absolutely genius use of material. The US patent for this shows the structure pretty clearly as well. And again, it's showing variants so that he's protected. I'll explain why that was important to him in a moment. In 1936, Breuer fled the Nazis and moved to England and went to work for Isocon, which is one of the earliest plywood manufacturers. We're going to look more at that when we do a deep dive into plywood in a couple of weeks. And then in 1937, he moved to the United States to teach at Harvard. The next person I want to look at, because it relates so closely to Breuer's story and they're intertwined, would be Mark Stamm. Mark Stamm was a Dutch designer who moved to Berlin and participated in a Bauhaus show in 1926, where he showed his smart idea to other people and they ran with it. And you've had that happen in your own life. You have something cool, you can't wait to share it, and you spend the rest of your days sorry that you shared it. So his smart idea was the concept of the cantilever. He took plumbing parts and joints and screwed them together and showed that you could have enough structure to support a person without back leg. The steel was strong enough to allow that to happen. And then everybody wanted to try it, including Marcel Breuer. And that led to a lawsuit. Mart Stamm made a cantilevered chromed tubular steel chair, and Marcel Breuer made a very similar chromed tubular steel cantilevered chair, and there was a big lawsuit about this. The judge ended up dividing the intellectual property in this chair and said Marcel Breuer was making tubular steel furniture before this chair, so he gets to be the person who made the first tubular steel furniture. And Mart Stamm introduced the cantilever, so he'll be the person who gets the patent for the cantilever. The problem is, all of the later furniture in chrome tubular steel was cantilevered. So the lawsuits continued and just kept challenging the landscape of what to call this chair. Is it a Stamm chair? Is it a Breuer chair? It's a very messy situation. If you're interested in this, there's a book by Christopher Wilkes about Marcel Breuer's furniture that has the whole story written out more clearly than anywhere else I've ever found it. Anyway, Mart Stamm's chairs continued to be produced in many versions over time. They're all variants of his pretty simple basic idea of the cantilevered form, and it's even unclear if Mart Stamm had anything to do with those design changes or whether those just happened at the manufacturer. Nevertheless, sometimes the chair is called a Stam chair, sometimes it's called a Breuer chair, and it's usually the exact same chair, regardless of who created the first model. I also just want to point out that you should be aware of images when you're looking at anything that is still in production or has been in production for a long time or went in and out of production. All three of these chairs are the S43, the Stam chair number 43, but the one on the left has a carved wooden seat and back, solid wood. The one on the upper right has laminated plywood, but it's an old one from the 30s. The chair on the bottom is what the chair looks like today which is also laminated plywood, but with tolerances and manufacturing capabilities that weren't possible in the 1930s. So the fasteners are flush uh, instead of proud and molded plywood that's a little more aggressively three-dimensional. So it's the same chair, but there are subtle differences. And I think it's important for designers to be able to see those differences and I hope even understand why they're happening. I hope you've noticed also that Tonnet has been making all this stuff. When Breuer was unable to find somebody to make this stuff, he started his own company. 
But pretty quickly, Tonnet realized they might not know a lot about tubular steel, but they knew an awful lot about bending. They knew how to support wood to keep it from tearing out as they bent it. They knew how to make jigs. They had all of the equipment needed to transition into this new material. And they hit the ground running and became the major producer of tubular steel furniture. In fact, Marcel Breuer, when he was unable to keep his own company afloat, transferred everything to Tonnet, which began producing his work from 1929 on. The next person associated with the Bauhaus that I think you should know about is Wilhelm Wagenfeld. He studied metalwork at the Bauhaus between 1923 and 25, and he designed probably the most iconic Bauhaus object, the Bauhaus lamp, with Karl Jakob Eucher. It also became one of the school's most popular products. It sold better than the other things they were trying to sell to the public. It's a complete expression of, of the Bauhaus theories. There are geometrical shapes, industrial materials. There's no concession to decoration or frivolity here. This is a serious lamp. It proved, in the end, too difficult to manufacture at the school, so it was farmed out to the outside. I hope all of my sophomores are looking at Wagenfeld in the metal shop with his bench dog and his perfect positioning for good filing techniques. After the Bauhaus, Wagenfeld had a long career designing consumer products. He's most remembered for the glasswork that he did for Jenner Glass and other manufacturers. And some designs are still in production today. If we get student presentations on Pyrex, I'll get those posted so you can see them. Just to file in here while you're listening to this, in 1915, Corning introduced borosilicate glass, which we call Pyrex, uh, and there were versions of that at the same time introduced in Germany, and that's what this stuff is. It's shock resistant and heat resistant, you can cook in it, and Wagenfeld found great success interpreting this new material into new forms. Just FYI, the RISD Museum has some Wagenfeld glass on view. The examples we have are designs from 1931, but probably were made later in the 1950s. Wagenfeld's Kubus containers are the objects that pop up most in museum collections and tragically don't seem to be popping up in my own house with the frequency that I would like. They are also made of heat resistant industrial glass and there are seven different sizes. They stack, they fit together, they share lids, the taller pieces have both a handle and a spout molded into them, and they can be used in the refrigerator, in the pantry, in the oven, on the table. In an effort to save time, I'm not going to bother explaining this slide. The coffee maker on the right is the version that Wagenfeld did, and you can see the difference between the Gerhard Marx version in the middle and Wagenfeld's even more bauhaus -y version of that. This is a design of Wagenfeld's that I love, so I want to show it to you, even though I can find no evidence that it was produced in 1930. It's made more recently by Technolumen, but I think it's a really lovely example of a very difficult thing to do when designing. It's a table lamp, or a wall sconce, or a task light. It has multiple positions, and it looks good in all of those positions. Most things that move have a primary position where they make sense visually, and then secondary positions where they look sad or compromised. The next person to look at is Marianne Brandt. She joined the Bauhaus in 1923. We think of the Bauhaus as a sort of liberal group of people, and they were, but women were not allowed in the shops. They were expected to go to the weaving studio or the stained glass studio or fine art. And Marion Brandt wanted to work in the metal shop. She quickly not only worked in the metal shop, but became a workshop assistant and then the workshop director in 1928. She was so adept at not only design and manufacturing, but understanding outside manufacturing, that she wound up negotiating all of the important Bauhaus contracts for collaborations with outside companies, for lighting and for metalwork. She left the Bauhaus for Berlin in 1929 and became head of design at a company called Rupel in Gouda, Germany, and she lived to be 89 years old. I don't know why I mention that, because so many of the women from this era who were so important and did such extraordinary things also lived a long time, so maybe there's something to that. Her work at the Bauhaus satisfies all of the expectations of a Bauhaus object. They are celebrations of basic geometry, but they transcend the basic geometry to become really beautiful, charming, complex, finished objects. Her ability to use symmetry and asymmetry, to combine fins with solid shapes, to combine materials 
were really sophisticated. So if you're ever struggling with that, go back and look at her work. You might think the teapot on the upper right-hand corner is just a hemisphere, but when you start to look at the base and the offset lid and the handle, you see that there are all these other subtle decisions about geometry. And there's no applied ornament here. The form and the materials are the decorative elements. This whole tea set was conceived as a prototype for mass production, but all of the parts were completely handmade. And as a result, they would have been too expensive to sell to make a broad audience possible. Only a handful were executed, and I still haven't tracked them all down to find out what they were made of. The MoMA says that their version is made of nickel silver. The Met says that theirs is silver. Other collections include examples that are silver plate over base metal, like copper or brass. I've zoomed in as much as any of those pictures will allow me to, to look at the seams, because that's where you can see if something is plated or not. And it's, it's just not really clear. But the goal was to make them inexpensive. So I'm going to guess that the goal was also to make them out of a, a plated base metal, which would be less expensive. Nevertheless, they were handmade and expensive. In 1986, Alessi started producing versions of the tea set in sterling silver not even interested in saving money by plating over a less expensive metal anymore because it was really just the Marion Brandt Bauhaus connection and how few of these there were out in the world that made them conceptually valuable in a way that the price tag didn't really matter anymore. And today, Technolumen is making a silver-plated brass version and selling it for $6,000. We don't even care if it's sterling silver anymore. The value is the fetish status, is the Marion Brandt and Bauhaus connection more than anything. Brandt also designed things that did make it into production. She was one of the first female designers who achieved industrial production on a large scale. The candom lamp that she designed sold very well. They sold 50,000 of them in the first four years after they were introduced. And many of her pendant lamps are still in production today. I love looking at these because if you didn't know they were from 1925, you'd never guess from the aesthetic. They would not look out of place in any home today or in any contemporary design showroom because they are celebrating geometry and manufacturing techniques and materials, not any particular style. I can't tell you much about Brandt's later work or this clock in particular, but I put it in because one, it exists and I want to show you everything I can find of hers from later. Two, when we get to looking at brawn and plastics and rational functionalism, I'm going to show you this clock again and ask you to consider if it doesn't look more 1960 than it does 1930. The last of the Bauhaus people I want to look at is Mies van der Rohe. He worked for Bruno Paul in 1905. He worked for Peter Behrens in 1908. And while working for Peter Behrens, he shared offices with Le Corbusier and Walter Gropius. So there's a whole network of architects at the time. He opened his own practice in Berlin in 1913. He became president of the Deutsche Werkbund in 1926, and you read about the Werkbund, and I did a really bad job talking about it in class, but that's the German organization that was trying to match designers with industry to get German products to be not only industrially produced, but also more elevated in terms of their design. He also worked with Marc Stamm and Marcel Breuer, and he became the last director of the Bauhaus when it moved to Dessau from 1930 to 1932. He came to America in 1938, where he headed the architecture department at the Illinois Institute of Technology. His MR chair was introduced in 1927, so he's also at the early edge of using tubular steel. It was designed for an exhibition in Stuttgart and has remained in production ever since. It's one of the only chairs from this era that got in production early and hasn't ever gone away. And this is a chromed tubular steel cantilever chair, just like the others we looked at, but a really different idea about how to arrive at that. Van der Rohe is using a large sort of graceful curve, and that's produced with a tubing roller, not a brake, not a tubing bender. So it's a different method of bending to arrive at the same sort of structure. I do not have enough information about Lily Reich to do her justice, but I definitely want you to be aware of her. She worked for Joseph Hoffman in Vienna in 1908, and she joined the Deutsche Werkbund in 1912, and she became its first woman director six years before Mies van der Rohe was its director. While at the Werkbund, she planned and curated design exhibitions that promoted German design that traveled around. One of them came to the Museum of Arm in Newark, New Jersey, with thousands of German objects, and that was really influential in America. It gave us direct access 
to German industry and progress that we wouldn't have seen otherwise. In 1926, she moved to Berlin and started working for Mies van der Rohe, and they had a personal and professional partnership for the next 12 years until he emigrated to the United States. I almost put this image in last week's talk about the history of kitchens because it's such a beautiful example of a designed kitchen. It was designed for an exhibition and it's a single person apartment kitchen. I believe after the exhibition it was put in limited production. The reason I want you to know about Lily Reich is that Mies van der Rohe made no furniture before Lily Reich entered his life and Mies van der Rohe made no furniture after he left and emigrated to the United States. So I'm not allowed to say that Lily Reich designed all this furniture, but that doesn't mean I'm not currently thinking it. Archival notes credit her with the development of the woven seating in 1927, uh, and also after Van der Rohe left for America, she continued to help support his children and his ex-wife during the war, which is pretty remarkable. So she's someone I just thought many of you would like knowing a little bit more about. If we move out of the direct Bauhaus circle, we see the same investigations happening in other places. Le Corbusier's work in architecture is very important, but he also did some important things in this story of tubular steel investigation and bringing architectural modernism into furniture design. He was not at the Bauhaus, but we're going to look at him anyway because it's the same story. He designed a building called the Esprit Nouveau Pavilion for the 1925 Paris Expo. And I don't know if you remember the other buildings I showed you from that expo, but they looked more like Smurf huts. Uh, they were the department store pavilions. This was very, very different looking. It was over on the side so as not to offend anybody. On the outside, it's all confident, new aesthetic. On the inside, it's a little less confident and a little more confused. If you look carefully at these pictures, you'll see that there's only two kinds of furniture. There are club chairs, which had to be custom made because the new modern door was too small for pre-existing chairs, so they were made smaller to be able to fit inside. And that's just a traditional generic leather chair. And then there are tonnet chairs. So this vision of the future is essentially being furnished with antiques. Le Corbusier was not able to find furniture that matched his aesthetic. His interests were inspired by American office furniture and trunks and filing cabinets. He was interested in discovering a kind of furniture that was standard and anonymous and versatile. We're going to take a side trip for a moment and look at Charlotte Perriand because she features into the story in a, in a really important way. In 1926, she had interiors on view at design expositions in Paris. She wasn't finding much success or satisfaction as a decorator and she was thinking of giving up design and she read Le Corbusier's writing and she said that it opened the wall before her eyes. In 1927 she completely broke with Art Deco as a style and forged a new path. She designed the bar in the attic which you see on the left for a display at the Salon d'Automne. She went to Corbusier's office with her portfolio and he was not impressed and didn't offer her a job. I included the picture on the right just because I love that picture. If I ever get to the top of the Alps, I'm also taking my top off. In 1928, she displayed her own designs for a dining room at the Salon des Artistes Décorateurs, and the studio, which was a review in Paris, wrote about this. Perhaps never before have I so definitely experienced the feeling of entering a new world, of a breaking with narrow traditions, be they ever so respectable, of a window opening into the future. The motor car, the airplane, and wireless have in a few years revolutionized the material conditions of life. Grave social questions, home life, housing, the position of women, have altered our customs. At this time, the artists have not remained outside that movement. They've progressed with it, and sometimes even gone beyond it. Corbusier, who had been wondering how to furnish his new architecture in a modern way that would match it, saw Perrion's work in this exhibition and realized whoever did this was the perfect fit for what he was doing, without realizing that it was the same person he had turned down so recently. So in 1927, Corbusier hired Charlotte Perriand to work at his firm designing interiors and furniture for his architecture. They both wrote about this relationship and expressed that he helped her appreciate ideas about standardization, and she helped him think about the importance of living in a space, domestic life, kitchens, bathrooms, arrangement of interiors, not the aesthetic, but the actual use, what she called the art of living. There were a lot of conversations in the office between Corbusier, Jean Array, his cousin, and Perriand 
about the different postures and seating positions that they needed to consider when designing furniture. And the endless talk began to frustrate Periand, so she went out and found hardware and leather and a metal worker to fabricate prototypes that matched the conversations they were having. And she arranged them in her apartment and invited Corbusier and Jean Ray to come over. And they were delighted to see their conversations about design realized in objects. There were three pieces of furniture made at this point. The picture on the lower right is what you know this chair looks like because you've seen it in every dentist's office or dermatologist's office, and it's rigid and it's rectangular. In fact, the prototype is in the picture above where it's a big sack of feathers contained in this metal frame. Remember that we didn't have foam, foamed plastics, until 1965. So since 1965, we could make this as rectangles. But before that, it was down pillows covered in cotton or covered in leather, and it was squishy and alive. And I much prefer that. I think that contrast between the rigid metal and the soft upholstery is really exciting. The seat with the swinging back is so unlike a Marcel Breuer chair. There's no interest here in one line of tubular steel. There's no interest in eliminating joints. So this is a great example of what happens when you have to cut and fit and weld a joint. Each side of this chair is a structural unit that's been handcrafted into its shape, and then they have to be chromed as one big part. So it was much more expensive to produce this chair, to fit the pieces, to weld them, to clean up the welds, to chrome plate them, and then assemble the chair. But the concern here was not manufacturability or price. It was the aesthetic and what it did for an interior. The third piece of furniture from this project, the chaise longue, is familiar to you if you watch the Art Deco bonus content lecture last week on the Maharaja of Endor because his palace included the earliest example of this chaise. And this is another great example of contemporary foam transforming an object. We know it should have that cylinder at the top, but in its day it was covered with less geometric and less rigid surfaces. When this furniture was new, it was credited solely to Le Corbusier. It's only over time with re-examination and reconsideration that we now put all three designers' names on here. I don't think it's impossible to imagine a future where Periand is given more credit for this. Charlotte Periand was able to start the ball rolling with Corbusier to get his interests satisfied, but when she left his firm, she started to really look at how she could take her design abilities and these materials and this opportunity to create a new aesthetic and do something that would not only be more popular visually, aesthetically, but also in terms of manufacturing and the price. She realized the limitations of industry and she looked for ways that she could take serially produced metal and glass furniture and make it less expensive, but also make it more closely aligned to popular taste. Maybe metal could be used in a way that was less cold. Maybe wood could be used in a more contemporary way. In 1941, Perrion worked as an advisor to Japan's Department of Trade Promotion. And while in Japan for well over a year, she also revisited some of her earlier designs in different materials. She continued her exploration of more casual furniture. And this is a lovely example of an exploration to combine all three of the seating postures that Corbusier's office had come up with into one piece of furniture. You can sit upright, you can relax, you can recline. In 1950, she published her own manifesto, The Art of Living, and she investigated domestic design. She looked at bathrooms and kitchens and ventilation and cleaning and children's rooms and how design of interiors could affect the life that happens in those interiors. She also looked at modular units for home closet use, but also for dormitories. This system, with the patented pull-out drawers and the multiple possible configurations, predates IKEA's versions of this that we're familiar with by many decades. Her later work looked at designing high-use public places, ski resorts, hotels, and she also looked at how she could do a modern take on local vernacular styles. Last year I was at the Chicago Art Institute and I got to see something I never thought I would see in my life. It's the kitchen and bathroom at the bottom of this slide. This is a prefabricated unit she designed for Les Arc Ski Resort and it was made off-site and craned in in parts and assembled in place. It's the utility core for very small ski resort housing. And it's insanely beautiful aesthetically, but really, really smart as a designed object. And the kind of thing we don't get to look at when we're considering designers, because small prefabricated bathrooms and kitchens 
one, never survive, and two, never make their way into museums. So, so props to the Chicago Art Institute for saving that. She lived to be 96 years old. She died in 1999. There are about 8,000 more reasons to fall in love with Charlotte Perrion. So I'll attach a link below and also in the floating info button above to a longer talk I have about Perrion in case you want to know more about her. If we get back to the tubing story, because I know that's really why you're here, by the mid-1930s, tubing was everywhere. Every designer was testing how they could do their own version of this new material. These are Heath Robinson cartoons making fun of the whole thing, when this new aesthetic and the old world collided. So now I just have a parade of tubing experiments. No one of them really matters all that much. I just want to give you a sense of how quick this explosion and this exploration really was. Of course, there are going to be more investigations in Germany because Tonnet lived there, so people had access to manufacturing. And Anton Lorenz is a shady character you're going to meet a few times today. He's the one who made all the legal trouble for Marcel Breuer and Mart Stamm. He was one of the partners in Marcel Breuer's company. He produced the Mart Stamm chair, and he spent the rest of his life suing people. Walter Knoll is interesting to me because he was in Germany, but he lived outside the confines of the Bauhaus. He was older. He was a third generation furniture maker who already had his own furniture company making wooden furniture. And so when this new material arrived, he thought, well, I'll give that a spin. But he didn't feel any particular need to be as pure about it as the other Bauhaus designers were being. He also was the father of Hans Noll, whom we're going to look at in a few weeks. But tubular steel was being used in every other country throughout Europe as well. And look for the differences in manufacture. This is René Herbst in France. And he's doing something very much like Corbusier and Perrin de Jean Ray did, which is not really worrying so much about the single line, not worrying so much about the joints. This is high-end French handmade expensive furniture and proud of it. Louis Sognon and Charlotte Ailly in France were exploring what the material could do. The pair also created furniture for the Maharaja's palace, and a version of the chair in the upper right was there as well. I love André Sornier's chair because this is a great example of a one-line chair. The tubing goes on a crazy ride all around the place, but there ends up being one structural component, which looks like it's one piece of tubing. I wish I could tell you more about Adrienne Gorska. I can tell you that her sister was Tamar de Lampichka, who created the image I started my Art Deco talk with and then forgot to even talk about. To make up for that, I posted an article about her on the class Tumblr page that you might want to look at. She was well worth knowing. But Adrian Gorska, in addition to being the sister of one of the most famous Art Deco painters, was an interior designer and an architect. She was one of only a handful of trained female architects working at the time. And in addition to designing this furniture for her sister's studio, she taught Eileen Gray to draw architecture. So if you watch the bonus round lecture from last week on Eileen Gray, you may remember that she wanted to work for Corbusier to learn architecture. He was not interested in teaching her architecture, so she had to go off and figure it out on her own, and Adrian Gorska taught her how to draft. And you can see in all of these chairs the same exploration that Breuer had. How do you use the tubing in one line? How do you have the joints? What do you put on the tubing to hold a person up? Is it woven? Is it solid? How does the tubing meet the floor? These designs show one of the challenges in tubular steel chairs, which is if you have a flat sled at the bottom, it might not meet the floor nicely, but if you have a slight bend in the middle, you, you just lift the middle up off the ground and make it into a four-point connection, or you lift it up more and make it a decorative element of the design. In England, Practical Equipment Limited, which was called Pell, also pursued tubular steel, and you can see the chair in the upper right, which might as well be a Breuer chair or a Stam chair. It's so close. And the tables at the bottom show a couple of variants on the same exercise of avoiding having a joint at the corner. And also remember, it's not just chairs that are getting made at this point. Pell was making a whole range of furniture, and this is a pretty nice example of a tubular steel bed. The basic idea is either migrate from one designer to the next or are just reinvented by each person because there's only so many things you can do when bending this tubing and trying to support a person or a radio. Giuseppe Tarani's chair is one of my favorites because it's still a cantilever, but it's changing the approach. So it's, it's a cantilever from in front instead, and then the back becomes this wonderful S-curve that introduces some movement so you get flexibility. 
Usually in this class, there's a student presentation on Paul Henningsen, and this year he's out of rotation, which is unfortunate because he is the greatest lighting designer in the history of lighting design. His lamps really beautifully combine form and function in ways that, that have so much to teach us. Unfortunately, when he approached tubular steel, I think he had less success, so I'm just going to skip that one. Also, a lot of the old guard that had been around for a while started to explore what this new material could do. J.J. Oud in the Netherlands, who was part of the Dessau movement with Rietveld, tried his hand at, at chromed tubular steel, and even Rietveld got involved. He seems to have preferred painted tubular steel, but he did a number of explorations of how his aesthetic could attach itself to this new material. The famous Swedish architect, Eric Gunnar Opsland, proved that you can make a beautiful chair that is the world's biggest tripping hazard. I'm not trying to say that each of these is important or worth knowing about. I just want you again to sort of appreciate how many examples there were. Even my hero Peter Behrens from the Art Nouveau era felt that he had to give this a go. And I hope you already saw all of the work that Eileen Gray did in tubing. And imagine what could happen with all of the non-chair opportunities. Unfortunately, this record player and radio did not stick around long as a designed object, although Bang & Olufsen sure did. But the Tonnet catalogs, in addition to being full of chairs, are full of all sorts of other things. Plant stands, music cabinets, desks. Also, it's not that I can't figure out how to spell this guy's name. It's spelled differently in every Tonnet catalog. I don't think they could figure out his name. These two objects have nothing to do with each other. I gang them up on this slide because I wanted you to see them. On the left is an American production radio. And on the right is a totally obscure one-off thing that lives in the Vitra Museum collection now, but because it's the 100th anniversary of Bauhaus, it just keeps popping up as something we're supposed to know about. I know nothing about this designer, and I don't think this is an especially impressive chair, but I wanted to include this because this is a rare example of a non-chair tubular steel object I can show you. It's an electric heater. One of the reasons we have so many chairs to look at is that they're sturdy and they last a long time, so they didn't tend to, to break or get junked. Whereas something like an electric heater would very quickly become obsolete and a better heater would be available. So they tend not to last as long. Also, in World War II, anything made of metal that could be spared was scrapped for the war effort. You might be more inclined to keep a chair, which has more use, than a 10-year-old he electric heater. I want to end this chapter by looking at Hans and Vasily Luckhart, German architects. Their furniture, produced by Tonnet, was made of wood, and I don't think there's anything to be learned from it. It's furniture that folds up, but I don't think it looks good folded, I don't think it looks good unfolded, and none of it looks especially comfortable. But when they switched to tubular steel, the whole equation changes. Their work is so much more exciting. And I'm intrigued by both of these pieces of furniture because they're combining the sort of graceful large curves of Mies van der Rohe with Marcel Breuer's ideas about cantilevering. They're doing a, a mashup of all the different ideas that were explored in tubular steel. And it's their second generation that I find especially satisfying. This is a chair you might recognize because the Maharaja of Andorra owned a number of them. I think this chair arrives at an unbelievably elegant and beautiful expression of what a one-line continuous piece of chromed tubular steel can create when also making a chair. But this chair never met with widespread success because th they were so difficult to produce and as a result expensive. The curves along the front of the chair are made on a roller and they're a compound curve, it's not a, a steady curve and the bending changes axis all over the place. So some of these bends are made on a tubing bender, some are made by rolling, they all have to end up lining up. And then the MoMA's website shows the underside of one of their chairs, so I've blown that up, it's pixelated, I know, but it's big enough that you can see and there's an extra piece that connects the tubular steel and the plywood seat. And I've never seen this in person because in museums you're not allowed to see the undersides of things. I don't know if it's cast metal, and I don't know if it's attached before the chrome plating, and I don't know if it's welded on or mechanically attached somehow. Also, this chair was produced by a company called Desta, which was founded by that shady guy, Anton Lorenz, and that company folded in 1932. So for the first two years, it was made by one company, and then Tana took over production after that. 
I wanted to end with this chair, partly because I think it's the apex of what Marcel Breuer and Mart Stamm introduced when they first started playing with tubular steel, but also because I think it pairs so nicely with the Nathan George Horwitz chair made in America to help introduce the next chapter, which is what happened when American designers who were a little more interested in manufacturing and consumption and price control discovered this European sensibility. I'm going to end the first part of this class where we would normally take a break. And I'm going to post the second half as a separate video. These are two videos that I would normally be showing you during the break. So I'm going to include links to allow you to find them on your own. On the left is a ballet produced at the Bauhaus, recreated for this video in 1970. And on the right is New Order's True Faith video. I can't imagine why you would want to miss an opportunity to watch both of these. So watch them on your own. And then when you're ready to come back, come back for the second half of this talk, which will investigate not how you want to hear about the Bauhaus, but instead how I want to talk about manufacturing. Okay, see you later. Mm -mm -mm. I almost put, <laughs> I'm doing every slide three times. <laughs> I'm doing this so badly. Cantilever, tubular steel, damn. I'm recording my lecture, how can I help you? All right, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get back to recording this because I'm only on slide 43. Okay, bye. I'm starting this whole thing over. Wait, why is this here? Oh dear, it's in the wrong place. These pictures don't really belong together. The picture on the this left. This toaster is too shiny, man. Well, let's figure out how we can that. contextualize that. These pictures shouldn't toaster. be on the same don't slide. Nobody so can make it work. Yeah. I'm going to moisturize nope. now. Still shiny. One can't speak with dry oh, well. lips. Okie dokie. I wish you could see my notes. It just says so many effing chairs. Blame the architects. What do you mean by that?